Well, like I said, today we're jumping into the finale of this series. You are here. I'm going to preach a message called Taking New Territory. Somebody say, Taking New Territory. Don't forget, next week is online only. Online only. You're going to enjoy it. Uh, we got a little something special planned for you online. Week number one, I preached a message called Made for the Middle. Week number two, Pastor Kerry preached a message called Why You Running? Last week, I preached a message called Uncharted Territory. And like I said, today I'm preaching a message called Taking New Territory. Because I happen to believe that every single person in here, online, upstairs, under the sound of my voice, there's something for you to accomplish that's greater than where you currently are. And in order for you to get to that place... To take that new territory, you're going to have to be able to apply some new keys in life. And I believe we're going to do that today. I really believe that you could get bored and fall asleep this morning. Or, or, or I believe that the trajectory of your life could absolutely change. I believe that your marriage could be different when you leave. I believe that the way you parent could be different. I believe that the way you go to work could be different when you leave if you'll lean in to what God wants to say to you this morning. I'm going to get out of my wheelhouse and I'm going to teach you a little bit instead of preach. And so I hope you guys will be okay with that. Um, matter of fact, I better pray before I get started. Otherwise... Well, you know what a mess that'll be. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for the wonderful opportunity we have this morning to be in your presence. God, we don't take it lightly. It is a big deal. And so we pray that by the power of your spirit, you would lead us and guide us, that you would show us Jesus like we'd never seen him before. God, because we know it's upon revelation of Jesus that our lives become more. So do in us, do through us today what only you can. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give one fist bump to the person next to you. Tell them it's really good to see you. For real. In August of 1803, shortly after the Louisiana Purchase, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Second Lieutenant William Clark set out on an expedition to discover the best path west across what we now know as the United States. The request was a detailed map showing the territory that they had charted in order for others to later follow and establish a presence. See, there was a race for this territory between the United States and the Europeans, and in order for that land to be marked, for it to be, uh, um, for it to be established, we had to find a way to get there in order to establish a presence so that the Europeans didn't get it before we did. How many of y'all know that was a big deal? It was a big deal. And I begin to think about this as we're charting territory or we're taking new territory. And I realized that the reason that this was so important is because they were literally mapping out territory that had, was completely uncharted. It had never been traveled. It had never been, uh, it, 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 it had never been mapped out before. And so it required mapping or charting. And if you're going to take new territory, how many of y'all know that it's necessary for you to chart the territory that you're taking? Otherwise, you may not be able to pass that way again. Anybody? Here's why it's important today in church. Some of you guys are like, okay, what does this have to do with church? It's got everything to do with church, everybody. I'm asking you to wake up and really lean in. Here we go. This is what it has to do with. Because in the Old Testament, I've taught you that God promises us land, right? However, in the New Testament, God promises us a life. He, he promises to bless our lives, to bless our heart, to bless us. 
So we're looking at land and we're looking at lives. We're seeing that you have to chart land in order to really take over that territory. If you're going to take over the new life that God's calling you to, then you're going to have to chart something. But here's what happens is it makes sense for us as far as land is concerned. Think about it. God gave the Old Testament people land. What did they do? They sent teams of people out to survey the land. God gives you a heart, and we don't do anything with it. God gives you a, a promise of a life, and you don't do anything with it. Well, whatever will be, will be. I can't tell you how many people have turned away the opportunity for premarital counseling. God's promised you a life, and you want to stumble into a relationship? Come on, everybody. We have to chart the territory or the life that God's giving us so that we know where we are, but also where we've been. Because knowing where we've been will help us navigate where we're going. It is absolutely impossible for us to take new territory without keeping an accurate, you should write that word accurate down, without taking an accurate inventory of where we've been or where we are. We must find a way to chart the territory of our lives. It's begun to make sense that we would chart the territory of our land. It, it has begun to make sense that we would keep track of where we've gone, where we've been, where we're going. However, when it comes to our life, we just flippantly walk through life. And I think that that's why a lot of us are carrying hurt that we don't need to carry. We're carrying disappointment that we don't need to carry. We have low expectations for a life because of where we've been without even realizing if we were to chart something or map something out, we could raise our level of expectation. So here's what began to happen with me a couple of months ago is I've been doing this thing that I call a heart check Every month, first Tuesday of the month, every month for about the last two and a half years. And um, about six weeks ago, whenever I had finished up, I was looking at my entries in my journal and I realized, holy cow, this day I was feeling really good. And so uh, I, I, I wrote in here and could lead myself to believe that I had the greatest month of my life. And then literally the next month, I had had a bad couple of days, and so I had written in my journal, and I convinced myself, if I'm reading in six months, that I had the worst day of my life. Because how many of y'all know that if you only go according to your feelings, your feelings will lie to you, and they'll convince you that, oh my gosh, man, it's never been better, or it's never been worse, and so here I was looking back on this, on this last six or eight months, and I was literally on a roller coaster, like up and down and up and down and up and down. And you guys might say, well, Pastor Matt, you, you seem to be a little emotional, so that makes sense. But if we're to be honest, I think all of us can get caught up in our emotions at times, can't we? And if we happen to come around to this place where we're checking our heart on a high day, then it's good. But if it's a low day, then it's bad. And we can convince ourselves that things are worse than they are or that they're better than they are. Like, have you ever been really low and then you start taking inventory of what's real and you're like, oh, it's not as bad as I thought. This, this guy is, in fact, not falling. You know what I'm saying? Or you've been taking inventory of things and you think things are great, but your wife's like, hey, we need to do some work in our marriage. And you're like, what? No way. I'm kicking butt and taking names, man. There's no way that's true. Well, here's what I feel like the Lord led me to. And this is why it's important. A new way to do a heart check and we're calling it here the heart chart, okay? I've, uh, I've taught it to um, our staff. I've taught it to our leaders. And now I'm teaching it to you because I think that this needs to become a part of the, of the rhythm 
of our lives in our church. Because here's the deal. I love that you showed up to church this morning. But you know what I don't love? Some of you showed up to church putting on the pretend person that you think you need to be in order to walk through the doors of a church. And that's not what we're looking for. That's not what we're looking for. Because you got a pastor that used to punch windshields out of cars. I'll tell you more about it sometime. <laughs> Literally would pick objects up and throw them across the room. Grabbed my son's cell phone, threw it at my wife because I got angry. And as these things are happening, I'm like, gosh, man, what's going on in my heart? Showing up to preach a message and encourage people to point them to Jesus, but I'm carrying things in my heart. And I realize it's because we're people. We're flawed. We're hurting. There's disappointment and pain in each and every one of us. And if we don't learn how to deal with it, we will force ourselves to mask it to become somebody that we think people want to see rather than who God really has called us to be. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I'm not, we're not interested in you feeling the pressure to have to perform and be somebody that God hasn't called you to. But we're also not okay with you staying in the place where you're hurt and you're disappointed and you've never navigated these feelings, because God's called us to something greater. The Bible says this, as a man or a woman thinks in their hearts, so they are. Proverbs 23, verse 7, for as they think in their hearts, that's who they are. It's not who you pretend to be. It's not who you dressed up to be today. It's not who you dress up to be tomorrow. In the deep, dark recesses of your mind or your heart, that's who you really are. How many people in your world know that person? See, everybody doesn't need to know your secrets, but somebody needs to know your secrets. Not everybody can handle it because some people might judge you or, or, or hold you at an arm's distance. Like, well, we'll just keep them over there. But somebody needs to know, because if somebody doesn't need to know, if somebody doesn't know, then you're constantly living as if you're hiding. And you're never navigating the hurt that weighs your heart down. Can I tell you something about hurt? It must be navigated. And when you navigate it, it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. It's really going to suck. But hurt that is dealt with hurts and it sucks for a season. Hurt that is undealt with hurts for a lifetime. It's going to hurt either way, one way or the other. You got to make the choice. Am I going to navigate it and let it hurt for a season? Or am I going to just not navigate it and let it hurt for a lifetime? The choice is yours. My hope for today is that we start getting into the recesses of our hearts and we start navigating some of these things together. Again, not everybody needs to know, but somebody needs to know. Well, Pastor Matt, I, I don't feel like I can tell my wife. Then find a friend that you can tell. I don't feel like I can tell my Find a friend that you think you can tell. We've got prayer people. We've got city group leaders. We've got team leaders. We've got hundreds of people that you can literally at any moment Say, I need to talk to somebody. Well, I don't know them. Maybe that's better than talking to somebody you know. Because if I can stand up here and talk about some of the stuff I'm talking about, you're not going to get judged. But if we're really going to do life, man, we've got to do this together. And we've got to allow our hearts to be healed because as we think or are in our hearts, so we are. That's the life that we will live. And that will be the limit of our life. This verse changed my life 18 years ago. And I want to share it with you. If you've been here for three Sundays, you've probably heard this. Psalm 139, 
23 and 24, it says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Search me, O God. I can remember reading this 18 years ago, broken, thinking that God had nothing, could do nothing with me. And I was trying to be all of these things because somehow right after I got saved, I stumbled into working at a church. I don't even know how it happened. Literally, I felt like such, I can't even describe to you how I felt. I didn't belong. I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't qualified. And so I bought all the suits that I could buy. And I wore all the ties that I could find. To try to fit into a position and put on a show for as many people as I possibly could. And I think that some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're not wearing a suit today. You're not wearing a tie. But you're trying to put on for people to cause them to think something about you that's not true. What an exhausting place to live. So search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me, God, that offends you. Have you ever thought that there's anything in your heart that offends God? And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Can I tell you something? The hurt that you're hanging on to, that's offensive to God. Because he paid the price for it with his son Jesus. It's time to let it go, everybody. The disappointment, the anger, the pain, the insecurity, it's time to let it go, everybody. So here are the three things that we're going to have to do in order to really begin to navigate our hearts. Number one, give access. Give access. Write this down. Give access. You got to give access to God. Okay, God, you got access to me. Search my heart. I remember we were, uh, we were youth pastoring. It was, it was the first gig that we had, and, and they, let us, they let us youth pastor. The, not, not like actual youth pastor, like, okay, you get the middle school kids. You know what I mean? Everybody knows if you can pastor middle school kids, well, it takes a special call to do that, right? They said, here, you got the middle schoolers. And we're like, okay, cool. And literally, I remember preaching this scripture, and I talked about the bat light. You know, they go on the roof, and the big, the big light, and Batman shows up. And he's like, Bruh. you know. You guys know Batman. Um, anyway, and I started thinking about that. You know, God, I want to I wanna give access to your searchlight on my heart. And any time you shine that light and something shows up, I want to deal with it. So, God, I'm giving you access. If you don't want it there, I don't want it there. I don't care if everybody else is okay with it. I don't care if everybody else says it's cool or that's the way to, I don't care. I don't want it. If you don't want it there, I don't want it there. I give you access to my heart. The second thing that you got to do is you got to give authority over to God. See, because God, a lot of times, he'll point things out to you, and you know, some of us in this room, you know, you're carrying things that God doesn't want you to carry anymore. But you haven't given him authority. You've kept the authority for yourself. And you said, God, and here's what you're saying when you keep authority. You're saying, God, I'll deal with it when I'm ready. Okay. God's a gentleman. He will not push. But I wonder if you could just give him authority and say, God, you know what? I don't want to carry this stuff in my heart anymore. I know it hurts and it's painful. But some of us have carried pain and we've carried these insecurities, we've carried these disappointments so long because there's no expectation for us to take new ground if we're still stuck in the past. Come on, everybody. God's calling you to himself. He says, let's move forward. Don't let your life be defined by your past anymore. Let's give him the authority. And this, the last thing that we need to do is we need to follow him authentically. That means stay true to his path. Where he says step, you step. Where he says stay, you stay. We don't push past God. We don't do things outside of the way 
that he's calling us, but we follow him authentically. We stay true to him. So here's where it's going to get real practical, okay? Does this make sense? Okay, it's going to get real practical here. I hope you guys are staying with me. I told you it's a little bit of a sleeper, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. This is not my wheelhouse, everybody, okay? So here we go. So give access, give authority, follow authentically. That's very spiritual, okay? Like, okay, God, I gave you my heart, you know. Like, that's spiritual. Let's, let's boil it down. Let's reduce it down to very practical steps here. Can we do that? Okay, so if we're going to do these three things as we're navigating our hearts, something that we're going to have to consistently be aware of and familiar with in our hearts are the level of our hearts. Let me go here. I'm going to write up on this board, everybody, so be patient with me, okay? So heart First thing that we're going to have to be familiar with is our heart's involvement, okay? What are the things that our heart's involved with? The second thing we're going to have to be aware of is our heart investment. We're going to have to be aware of these things, okay? To what level is my heart involved? To what level is my heart invested? I'm going to have to stay in tune with what's going on on the inside of me. Why is this important, everybody? Some of us are like, nah, I don't know, Pastor Matt. I'm, okay, whatever. Because as a man is in his heart, so is he, Okay? You want to continue being the person that you are? Continue doing nothing with what you have. Come on, everybody. It's time for us to level up, not just as believers, but as men and women, okay? Some of you just finished another year of school. It's time for you to level up, everybody. I wish that I could have learned some of this stuff when I was 12 or 13 years old. I wish that I could have learned some of this stuff when I was in high school. I wish because then I wouldn't have carried so much baggage around for my entire life. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. All of us want to do something with our lives. All of us want to make a difference. Every area of our lives, we want to leave a mark. So based on the level of our heart's involvement and the level of our heart investment is how we will ultimately impact. And all of us want to make an impact. All of us want to make a difference. All of us want to leave our mark somewhere. Where you've been, will it matter? That's a question that all of us probably want answered. Maybe we're not in tune enough with ourselves at this point to realize we want an answer, but I promise you, there's gonna come a day in your life. I'm an old man now. You're gonna wanna answer that question, okay? So here are the three things that we're gonna have to be aware of with heart involvement. Number one, is we're, I'm going to write it in a different color. I don't know if it matters because I don't know if y'all can read my handwriting anyway, but I'm just going to go with it. Selfishness. Second thing that we're going to have to inventory on this side of our heart. Is self-serving. Self slash serving. Lastly, selflessness. So typically, the way that I'm wired, how I would inventory something is based on how I feel, right? But again, your feelings will lie to you. It's more subjective, okay? Like, well, how do I feel today? Anybody? Have you ever thought, oh, man, I feel good today, so I'm having a great day. I feel bad today, so I'm having a terrible day. How many times have you woken your kids up, and they're like, oh, I just don't feel good today. And you're like, get your butt up, get in the shower, have a glass of water, come eat some breakfast, and then tell me how you're feeling. 
How many of y'all know that after you shower, you feel better? After you drink some water, you're going to feel better. After you eat some breakfast, you're going to feel better. Your feelings will lie to you. And if you'll allow your feelings to lie to you, you will call in sick every day of your life. Sometimes you just got to get up in the face of your feelings and you got to tell yourself it's time to show up. Do not let your feelings lie to you. Some of you are going to keep a job for an extra year now because of that. You're welcome. Some of you employers are going to get more people coming to work. You're welcome. (laughs) But your feelings will lie to you. And so for years and years and years, all I was doing was looking at my heart's involvement. Well, I feel like this today, and so I would write about this. I feel like this today, so I would do this. And that's okay, but the problem is there's nothing objective. There's no, there's no real data. There's no black and white. This is it. And I think in order for us to grow and to move forward, we're going to have to be aware of both. Some of you are more objective. You like the facts. You like the data. You want to see the, okay, but you got you to learn how to be in touch with your feelings too. It's both and, not either or. So here we go with heart investment. We've got time, talent, and treasure. And so here's, here's, what, here's what I want to tell you. Selfishness means this. It's not your first, it's not your most, and it's not your best. Somebody say not. Not my first, not my most, not my best. Self-serving is just enough so that you can save face with the people around you, but it's still kind of about you. So, so you're actually, you're growing from the place of selfishness, but you're still not to the place yet of selflessness. And selflessness is, I'm offering my first, my most, and my best. Does that make sense? So, as I'm inventorying, as I'm doing this heart chart, as I'm taking a look at this, in order for me to be in tune with what's going on in my life, I need to filter it through at the top of that sheet is, who am I called to be? Not, listen to me, listen to me, especially you men, not what you're called to do, but who you're called to be, okay? God doesn't care about what you do, because if you are who he's called you to be, you will do what he's called you to do. Do you hear what I'm saying? So I'm called to be a son, his son first, Then I'm called to be a husband to my wife. I'm called to be a father to my children. Then I'm called to be a pastor. Do you hear what I'm saying? So everything that I'm looking at when I'm doing this heart chart or the heart check, I am filtering through what does this look like? So time, how do I gauge my time? Well, who keeps the calendar? Anybody? Anybody? Are you giving your first, most, and best to the call that God's placed in your life? I don't know the answer, only you do. Your talents, are you giving your first, most, and best to God? Or are you doing just enough to save face so that everybody thinks you are? Do you see what I'm saying? Your treasure, are you doing your first, your most, and your best according to who God's called you to be? Here's the beauty. I can't answer these questions for any of you. Only you can. This is a self-awareness exercise. And I believe that as we become more aware of ourselves, and the more honest we become with ourselves, the more honest we can be with one another. I would say 90% of the marriage counseling we do one or the other sit across the table from us and they say, I just feel like they're hiding something. I just feel like I don't really know them. And can I tell you, almost 100% of the time, it's true. But can I speak to the lie of the enemy? The lie of the enemy is, when I'm closed off to my wife, it's because I'm a dirty, rotten scoundrel and I've got things that I want to hide. But the truth is, 
What I'm doing, what I've been taught to do my whole life is to guard my heart and to protect myself. And it's a self-preservation mechanism so that I don't get more hurt. Because the reality is I've never been healed from the place where I was abused or taken advantage of as a young person, which has made me do all of the stupid things that I'm doing currently in my life. But what it does is it establishes a wall between my wife and I or the most significant relationships. What needs to take place is healing on the inside of us. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so what the enemy does is he continues to drive a wedge thinking that you're against one another. You're not against each other. The problem is I'm selfish. I'm trying to to protect myself. And by protecting myself, I'm not making myself vulnerable. And so there's a wall between us. This heals all of that. And nine times out of ten, everybody, it's not because I'm lying to her. I'm actually lying to myself. And I've convinced myself that there is a truth that is not true. How do I address a lie in my life? Not based on how I feel, but not only based on what I see. It's a combination of both. And so am I, according to the call of God on my life, able to be honest You know what? As a dad right now, as a dad right now, I feel like I'm doing I'm doing pretty good. So I probably am about right here. Okay? As a husband right now, I know one thing my wife loves is when I do the dishes. So I did the dishes one time over the last 30 days. So as a husband, what am I doing? Not as good as I'd like to. But the only way for me to see this is to be honest about where I'm at. I'm going to challenge you a step further. You see where I put my marks? There's still a lot of white space. What do I want you to do? I want you to write in there how you feel. Well, I don't know how I feel. Then spend some time with it and figure it out. Spend some time with it and figure it out. Well, I don't, you know, shut up. (laughs) You're not that cool, you're not that macho, and you're not that tough. Get in touch with the way that you feel so that you can teach your kids how to be the men and women that they're called to be. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because I don't want my kids to be the type of husband that I've been. And I don't want my kids to be the type of wife that she's, I want them to be better than we've been. We're setting a standard and we're raising the bar, but they're going to take it to the next level by the grace of God. If we'll do the work and if we'll go the distance. Because my go-to emotion, whether I'm feeling rejected, insecure, um, unqualified, or whatever the case may be, you list off all the things that I carry from my childhood, my go-to emotion is anger. Like I said, I punched a hole through the windshield in our car while we were driving down the highway. Anger. Because I felt rejected. I've thrown a phone across the room. Anger. Because I felt unqualified. I've stormed around the offices, making everybody think, God, I don't want to be here today. All because I didn't feel qualified to be where I'm at. It has nothing to do with the current situation or circumstance. It has everything to do with a moment when I was three years old. And I felt inadequate. I felt like somebody else was smarter or more gifted. It's a whole story. And so no matter what, my go-to emotion was anger. In case you didn't notice, I'm a big guy. And so I can be scary. And that became my go-to. Maybe yours isn't anger. Maybe it's humor. Well, if I can detract attention away from this, by being funny. 
Maybe you just withdraw or disconnect. I don't know what it is for you, but you do. If you don't, my prayer is that you learn about it. And over the course of the next year, you'll have 12 opportunities because the first Tuesday of every month at Mercy City is gonna be Heart Check Tuesday. And we're gonna go to the heart chart. And my hope is that your, your morning prayer time will be spent with the heart chart or your evening prayer time, whenever you do it. And over the course of months, you'll be able to see the territory that you charted. And you'll be able to track the territory of your heart and life and the place where God's called you to be. Come on, we're going to do this together. That's the reason that you're here. So you don't have to do this alone. I'm sick of people feeling like they got to do life alone, man. I don't care who you are, or where you're from, or what you've been through, or where you feel like you're going. You don't have to go this thing alone. Thank God for people like Lewis and Clark. But you know what? Thank God for people like Brock and Chloe. And thank God for people like Jim and Lori. And thank God for people who have been willing to go through this before us to help us out. Come on, would you guys stand on your feet? Come on, would you put both hands on your heart? Close your eyes. I just want to pray for you. Father, thanks for everybody in the room. Lord, I thank, thank you for the way that you've spoken today. I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would take us there in our hearts. That we would be able to navigate them with humility and grace. Charting the territory that you're calling us to take. I say do in us and do through us today, God. What only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.